they created vertical stripes going up the front of the tower. Notice that the tower doesn't have 90 degree corners, it has two 45 degree corners, looks like they sliced off the building, makes it look narrower. And finally, up at the top, notice that it's stepped, it has setbacks that go in and up and in and up, so the tower is the narrowest part of the building. The idea was make this building look like it disappears into the clouds. Okay, we're gonna go back for a moment to the historic revival style for a building on the left, just after the bridge. The building on the left is the London House Hotel. It was built in uh, 1923, designed by Alfred Allshuler, and uh, the purpose of it was headquarters for a, um, an insurance company that insured ships. Two things to notice about this. One is it's in three parts. The bottom where you see the entrance is the, the base, then a long stretch without too much ornamentation, that is the shaft, and at the top is the capital. More ornamentation again. Uh, those three parts are supposed to make the building look like it is a classical column, a base and a shaft and a capital. But take a look at the Greek and Roman heritage here. At the base, archway for the entrance, classical Corinthian columns uh, beside those, and then when you get all the way to the top, back to the columns and the arches, there's even, you may have noticed, a temple on the top of the building. Uh, one thing next is that there's a tan uh, terracotta covered building coming up on your left. It has a tall tower coming up out of the center. It's another historic revival building. It's from 1926. It's by Yever and Denkelberg. It is designed to try to look like an Italian palace from the 1400s. So bring back history is the idea here. Um, it was known almost forever in its history as the Jewelers Building, and the reason for that is that jewelers like to have their offices there for security purposes. In this building were elevators that took cars as well as people. So jewelers could drive their cars in the basement. They and their jewelry went uh, and their car went upstairs to the office. They came back down to the business right out on the street. No danger of having the jewelry stolen when they're walking along the streets. To your left, we're going to look at uh, two parts of the Chicago Riverwalk. Chicago has built a riverwalk from Lake Michigan behind us to the point ahead of us where the river splits into branches. Between every two bridges is a different food for the river. The one on your left now, you see a fountain and some plaques in the background. It is Wabash Plaza. Uh, the purpose of it is to honor people from Illinois who were killed or who were missing in action as a result of the Vietnam War. So sort of a sedate place. People are sitting around and talking, but not too much excitement. Uh, another example coming up on your left is called the Marina. The purpose of it is not as evident as I hope, but the idea is that uh, if you have a boat and you're sailing your boat along the river, you're invited to dock it temporarily here to get off, you go to the city winery, get something to eat, something to drink, uh, then you can sit at the riverside, watch the people go by, watch the boats go by, uh, watch the building. You see some of you look at the, looking at the building complex on the right. Don't do that. Don't look at that building. Because we're going to get that later. Uh, we pass everything twice. I'm saving that one. Uh, we're going to go on and uh, we talked about the historic revival style. We talked about the art deco style. We're going to go on to style number three. Uh, which is the mid-century modern style, sometimes called the international style because you see it all over the world. The slogan of the time was less is more. And so after the bridge on your right, second building covered in blue glass is what we're going to look at next. It's the American Bar Association building in Chicago. It's from 1987, kind of a late bloomer. Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill were the architects. So take a look at this. These are all over the world where you live. There are probably buildings that look like this. Glass and steel rectangles. No masonry covering over this building. You can see the metal framing right here. 
Uh, again, it's a rectangle covered in glass. The windows look the same from left to right and from top to bottom. Uh, so very much the same all over. Uh, originally, this building where you see the guy in the orange shirt had an open air lobby. They're trying to make these buildings so that you'd appreciate the space on the inside. All of this glass kind of does that. But the see-through lobby, so you can see all the way through the building to the next street, did the same thing. So we'll do a little bit more of the history of this later, but that is the uh, international style. Okay, we're going to go back to Art Deco. Uh, beyond the yellow water taxi on your left, a building with the American flag at the base. Uh, this is uh, the Val Rocket building from 1930. It's by Oliver and Root. So one more thing about Art Deco buildings, or really buildings of the time. Notice the shape of this building. It has a tower with a spire on the top. It's the tallest part of the building. It's set back. It has two wings, one to the left, left of the tower, one to the right. Those wings are 264 feet tall, about 23 floors tall. Uh, until 1923, it was the law that you couldn't build a building any higher than that those 23 floors because the buildings were all very close to each other and they were pretty much office buildings. People needed light and air to be able to do their office work. If you let buildings be too tall, you would block the light and block the air. And no fluorescent lights then. Uh, and uh, no air conditioning then either. They changed that, uh, tried to do this quick. 1923, they changed the rules because there was pressure uh, for more office space. And the new rule was, okay, you can build it taller than the 23 floors if you do it with a tower. And if the floor space in the tower is no more than a quarter of the space on the lot that the building was on. So they were trying to make the tower thin and uh, allow the air and the light around the tower. Okay, we're going to go on now. We did three styles already. We're going to go on to style number four of the day, which is the postmodern style. Uh, that mid-century modern style went on for 30 years, 50s, 60s, 70s. Less is more was the slogan. After a while, people started to say less is a bore, and there was an architectural rebellion. Second building on the left here with the uh, slotted circle at the base is an example of that. It's 225 West Wacker Drive by Cohn Pedersen Fox. Um, some things about postmodern. One, bring back history. Notice what they've done with history. They have uh, made this building in three parts, just like the historic skyscrapers. Uh, so three parts going upward, and uh, also they have uh, covered it in stone, not just glass anymore. Big thing in the time. Uh, it's hard to see at the top of this building, but try it. Uh, there are two towers, one on the left, one on the right, an archway between. The big thing in postmodern was uh, make the building in context with the neighborhood, make it fit in. We're about to go under a bridge. Guess what it looks like at the top of the tower? Two uh, towers, on one on either side, and that archway like the leaf of the bridge. Uh, some other things too about that, but okay, you have a sample of Postmodern, next sample of postmodern coming up again on your left. Uh, curved green glass building. This is 333 West Wacker Drive, also by Cohn Pedersen Fox. This is mostly about context with the neighborhood. The river is green, the building is green. The river bends to the left, the building bends to the left. And if you look at the face of the building, you can see it's divided up into little squares. That's how Chicago is laid out in squares. And finally, this literally reflects the neighborhood. You can see the images of buildings across the river in the glass here. Uh, the, the very most important thing about this building is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. How many of you have seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Okay. Uh, nobody. Ferris's father worked here during the movie. They shot the movie in Chicago. So next time you see it, you'll be all sophisticated about the background. Also on your left, uh, we have the south branch of the Chicago River. We're going to be going there later. This is the end of the main stem. We're going to bend to the right now. We're going to see the north branch first. 
and as we go into the North Branch, we can anticipate styles of the 2000s, the, the uh, contemporary right now style. Uh, there's no official name for this style yet. It takes a while for architects to make up their minds what to call a style. Uh, so we call it contemporary. A friend of mine calls it relaxed modern, which I think is more descriptive. So uh, look at the first building on the bend here. Uh, kind of uh, gray in color, uh, glass and steel again. It's, it looks a lot like that mid-century modern, right? the glass and the steel, and uh, pretty much the shape. But notice it, it is relaxed, meaning that uh, it's not a rectangle. It has three depths on the, the left side that we're about to go past. Uh, it's a little uh, jazzed up metal rails going up, it has some pop-out windows on it, it has balconies, and they're not all the same, they're kind of here and there, so relaxed modern. This is Wolf Point West Tower by BKL Architects, it's from 2016. And something else to notice about the relaxed modern style is the support system. There's the columns at the base of this building. Uh, we have shifted more from metal frames to reinforced concrete as the means of holding the building up. So the thickness of those frames gives you the clue about that. Something more is there's a river walk here. This is not a city of Chicago river walk. The developers of the building built this river walk, not voluntarily. Uh, if you have a new building on the river, part of the permission is you must have a river walk and you must invite the entire public to come. Okay, to your left, pink building, oldest building we're going to see today. This is uh, Fulton House. It was built originally in uh, 1898. It's a cold storage warehouse. It's a giant refrigeration building. Uh, in 1981, Harry Weiss, architect from Chicago, was the, the first one to uh, design a conversion of a warehouse into a residential building. You can see by the balconies, uh, it's residential. You can also see it has thick walls. The walls were filled with horsehair and cork to keep the cool inside when it was a warehouse. Next building on your left, note the triangular size. Notice on the roof, there are lots of triangle shapes in the glass for the glass windows. Now uh, that's because this building, which is uh, the River Cottages from 1988, is postmodern and it's supposed to fit in with the environment. This is a river. On the river are boats. Some of them are sailboats. Guess what? They have triangular sails, thus it fits in with the neighborhood. They also give you a balcony, they give you a patio, they even give you a boat dock for your boat. It's very river-y. Okay, to your right, the new building. This is the um, East Bank Club. It is a health club. It was built in 1979. It was, I always freeze with, <laughs> with this architect. I guess I don't like it. Gordon and Levin. Okay. Uh, look at uh, the, the appearance of this. Not really very spectacular, trees and vines, but uh, it was even less spectacular when it was built. Uh, it is uh, very deliberately drab because in, up until 1979, the water in the river was extremely polluted. If you built a building, you did not want the building to face the river. You wanted people to see it from the other side. So the, the glacial entrance is on the other side. By the way, this is a posh health club. We call it a place where people like to see and be seen in spandex. Some members you might recognize are Oprah Winfrey, when she was here, she belonged. President Obama was a member of this. So, a popular place. Tower at the end of the East Bank Club right now. Uh, this is another contemporary style building. It's called King Ferry Plaza. It's an apartment building. Uh, notice uh, the variety here. This is no rectangle either. It is kind of like an oval with various kinds of shapes popping out from it. They uh, also have used different materials on the surface of it. They've used different colors. It's not ornamented. It's pretty simple, relaxed, modern again. This is by Let's see. Solomon Cordwell Benz. Next, on your right, 
red brick former warehouse. This is the, the uh, The Riverbank Loft. It uh, was first built in 1909. Nimmons and Fellows were the architects for this. Not until 1995 uh, did it get converted until, into a residential building. Take a look before we completely leave. You may have to turn around and look backwards on your right. Look at the balconies. You can tell they were not here originally. They hang off the building on cables. Popular place to live. People like being there because ceilings are tall, you can see the support timbers for the building, they got great views of, of the river in the meantime. We're coming to a park on your right next, it's Montgomery Ward Park, maybe some of you have heard of Montgomery Ward, he was the inventor of the mail order catalog and had a chain of department stores, and uh, we're coming to the area that was headquarters for his business operation. We'll talk uh, about the buildings around the park just a little bit. They're contemporary buildings. They're from the early 2000s. Used to be factories here, uh, but soon after 2000, then 3000 new people move in. If you notice the white building with the, uh, the framing in interesting shapes, that is Erie on the Park. It's from 2002 by Lucien Lagrange. Uh, glass and steel, but it's not that uh, mid-century modern or uh, international style at all. It is not a rectangle. It is a cra crazy in shapes. A lot of variety there. Uh, there are balconies here and there. They're all kind of placed differently and uh, faced differently. Uh, that uh, set of arrows or chevrons pointing upward gives the building strength. Gives it a appearance. Two people like that. with the yellow vertical elements on it. This is uh, River Place on the Park. It's from 2006 by Papa George Ames. A couple things about that. Uh, the yellow elements, they're here because uh, the, the architects went to Copenhagen, Denmark before they finished the design for the building. They noticed the buildings in Copenhagen were very brightly colored. They asked why that was, and the Danes said, in Copenhagen in the winter, things are very dismal, and we want to be cheered up, thus the bright colors. Well, in Chicago, it is triple dismal in the winter. It's much colder than Copenhagen. You get freezing in the light, and rain and snow, and the high winds and temperature variations of 50 degrees there, don't come back for a whole tour in January. Uh, so we're being cheered up here, but also notice the thing though, uh, notice the yellow elements are tall and narrow, they're very vertical. Uh, they're trying to make the building look taller. And notice the windows are the same, narrow and tall. And this is about being in context with the neighborhood because the next building coming up, the one that's kind of a cream color, uh, is an Art Deco building. Remember the idea in Art Deco? One of the ideas is make the buildings look tall. So uh, the newer building with the yellow is trying to emulate the older building, uh, tallness being the connection. The building we're beside now is uh, one river place. It used to be the office headquarters for the Montgomery Ward Catalog Company. And uh, it's from 1930. It was designed by Willis J. McCauley. Uh, so besides the tall and narrow windows, you can notice some other Art Deco things about this. Uh, notice the stepped round sculptures right before the bottom of the building. A lot of steps in Art Deco buildings. And notice that they've carved out kind of a tunnel at the bottom of the building. They had to build a river walk when they uh, made this a residential building. So easiest way, hollow out the first floor, they've got a river walk. Next thing on your right, immediately on your right, is the uh, former warehouse for Montgomery Ward. It is now called 600 West. It was built over a long period of time, beginning in 1906 and going to the 1940s. Um, and uh, it's interesting. First. Uh, reinforced concrete building in Chicago, biggest one in the world at the time, 1.2 million square feet here. Look up toward the top and notice that there are horizontal rows of bricks, kind of like horizontal stripes. Uh, that's because you may remember around 1906, the big style was that historic revival style. 
but there were people at the time who thought, why are we doing this? Why are we borrowing from Europe? We ought to have our own style. And you've heard of the Perry style of architecture. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright and others. The idea is, okay, we're on the prairie. The prairie is, is flat. Uh, you can hardly find a hill in Illinois. And uh, so our buildings ought to be long and low. They ought to match the terrain. Uh, by the way, if you worked in here, and it was a warehouse, you had to roller skates because it was 1.2 million square feet. You had to go through the whole thing, possibly, to fill a single order, and you better be able to roll. Okay, to the right. Uh, if you look in the distance, to the right, uh, you see quite a bit of nothingness, and you see some old warehouses that are still there. Uh, the island here is Goose Island. Chicago is no Goose Island beer. This is a uh, Greyhound bus repair facility. Everything to our right for years has been zoned for industry only. Uh, industry is kind of leaving Chicago. We are not so industrial anymore. They've changed the law. And now uh, you can build uh, skyscrapers, you can build office facilities, you can build residential buildings. That's started. Before we leave the industry, though, look up the river to your right. You see barges up there. They are full of gravel. There's a concrete mixing plant up there. And uh, that's handy because we use a lot of concrete in downtown Chicago. Okay, uh, they're changing. Remember the zoning? Look at this beautiful parking lot to your right. Uh, that's going, going soon to be called uh, 700 West. It's going to be a new skyscraper development. Four skyscrapers, three of them offices, one of them residential, connected with a plaza, a park all around it, because Chicago makes them do that, and a river walk also. Some come back soon, that'll be done. But you look to your left, back at the uh, warehouse facility, uh, move your eyes up to where it, it has the Groupon sign, uh, this building is primarily offices, um, also a lot of residential units. What I want you to do is look to your left between the buildings here. I want you to look at the tower on the Montgomery Ward office facility and notice two things. Green woman on the top and steps on the tower. Uh, the green woman is the spirit of progress. Gets noisy as a thing. Uh, the idea was that she was a logo for the Montgomery Ward Company, but it ties into Art Deco. Uh, on the towers in Art Deco, often they have gods and goddesses, usually Greek and Roman uh, mythological characters. Uh, here, Montgomery Ward made up his goddess, but there it was on top. The steps on the top of the tower are like the steps on a pyramid from southern Mexico and Central America. Pyramids were very much in style at the time, and so we see steps on towers in Art Deco. Okay, to your right, a uh, brick building called the Chicago Freedom Center, as in Freedom of the Press. It is the printing headquarters for the Chicago Tribune, which is the biggest newspaper that we have. Went up in 1981, designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Ten huge printing presses inside, uh, each of them uh, on a frame grounded in bedrock because of the vibrations. If they're at full speed, they can grind out 50,000 newspapers per hour. There's a lot of vibrations. They better be grounded. Uh, not just the Tribune, by the way, 40 other newspapers are printed here. We're not sure what is going to happen to this building eventually. Now it's leased. The property is leased by the Tribune. When the lease is up, uh, it might be this is all gone because the trend is get rid of the industry and create skyscraper buildings for offices and people. One more parking lot before we're done. This one has cars in it. Uh, this one is also going to be a new development within a few years. It uh, is going to have uh, several office towers, enough towers to uh, have 19,000 people working there, also residential buildings, enough for 6,000 residences. The whole story again with a park and a river walk because that's what we do. Okay, we are, I'm gonna tell you some things about the river, most of them unpleasant. Uh, if you don't like what I'm saying, then look at the skyline, it really looks great. Um, here's the unpleasantness. Uh, the Tribune wanted to have paper for printing brought here on boats. Uh, boats were going to sail in from Lake Michigan, they were going to sail up the river uh, behind us to that printing facility, drop off the paper. 
but they had to, uh, to, to dredge the river first. The, dr the river here is only about nine feet deep. It's only about nine feet deep because in 1900, when this was all industrial, and where it, when there was really no legal uh, barrier to dumping stuff in the river, then uh, people who ran factories just dumped their extra parts or timbers or whatever in the river. Uh, there were tanneries along the river. The tanneries uh, dumped chemicals using the tanning process into the river. Uh, when the Tribune asked the U.S. government to dredge the river, they found that the chemicals were still uh, down uh, at the bottom of the river. The chemicals were thought to cause cancer. Uh, they said, no way are we dredging this. The Tribune uses trucks and trains. Now for the most disgusting part of the tour. It is that Chicago used the river as a sewer. So the river uh, carried human waste. It carried human waste in the direction we we're going. Naturally, the river flowed uh, from the north to the south. We're going to the south. And then the current went out to Lake Michigan. It would take a left. It would go out past where our boat dock was. And uh, it would empty into Lake Michigan. Hmm, what is wrong with that? Uh, you may know now that Chicago gets its drinking water from Lake Michigan. It also got that then from Lake Michigan. So they thought that was solved. They did huge pipes underwater out far into the lake where the water was relatively clear. The drinking water was okay. But big rain in 1885, the river is higher than ever. It flows out into Lake Michigan. It goes past the openings of the drinking water pipes. People are drinking diluted, yeah, diluted sewage. Uh, they are, of course, angry. Uh, and they are demanding action, the ones of them who are not sick and dead. And uh, Chicago had to do something. They invented something called the Chicago Sanitary District to do something about the sewage. And uh, here's what they did. You may have heard of this. They made the Chicago River flow backwards. The river does not flow out into Lake Michigan anymore. It flows in from Lake Michigan instead. The way they did that, uh, we're in the North Branch, we're gonna go to the South Branch, where in 1900 they opened a canal 20 miles long, the deepest part of the area, deeper than the surface of Lake Michigan, deeper than the river, and uh, 20 miles long, so it goes into another watershed. Gravity takes care of this. So the, the um, current comes in from the, the lake, it comes to the place where the river splits, it goes into the south branch where the lowest part is, and it brings the current from the north branch along. Everything goes into the south branch. Oh well, sorry St. Louis, along the Mississippi. We had to do what we had to do. Okay, next, bridges. Black railroad bridge up in the air to your left. Uh, the leaf of the bridge, the part that trains used to go over with hundreds of tons. As soon as we get under that bridge, look over your left shoulder and look backwards, you'll see a decaying green reinforced concrete weight. That weighs hundreds of tons. The weight is the same weight as the leaf over the bridge. And so what they do in order to make the bridge go up and down is to use balance. Uh, this bridge is a giant teeter-totter. You can just push it a little and it will go up and a little and it will go down. The motor that operates it is said to be about the same horsepower as a Honda Fit and it, it moves these hundreds of tons. This is called a Trunnion Bascule Bridge. Trunnion is the axle in the riverbank between the weight and the leaf of the bridge. Bascule is, is French for a seesaw. That's how they all work. Uh, most bridges open on two sides. We're at Wolf Point. Uh, historic neighborhood now, building boom neighborhood. Take a look to your right. The building on your right that has a, a giant archway at the bottom, looks kind of oval shaped with notches on the ends, is River Point. It's from 2017. It's by Picard Chilton. Uh, it's on a lot that was hard to build on. Not many wonderful lots left along the river. The reason this was hard to build on is that it was full of railroad tracks headed to two railroad stations. So they have to build above the railroad tracks. Notice the circular openings, kind of like ports. Uh, you'll, if you look hard, you'll see there are fans there. The exhaust from the 
the trains comes out through there. They had to build a river walk where the trees and the dog are. They had to build a park all the way around the building, an acre and a half. Finally, then they get to build the building, 52 stories of, of office building. Next building we're gonna see, also on your right, after the bridge, is 150 North Riverside Plaza. That's also from 2017. It's by uh, Getch Partners. Here, they have a much smaller lot with cranes going through it. They have to build a river walk. You can see that at the base. They have to have a park going all the way around the building. You can see that at the next level up. By the time they do what the city requires them to do, all that's left to build on is 25% of a lot. So what they do is they have a base for the building. You can see it, it's gray, it's covered in, in uh, polished granite. Uh, it uh, only takes up 25% of the lot, it's very narrow. They have super thick columns, 10 feet each, 10 of them underground. They use the strongest uh, structural steel they can find. Uh, you'll see this again, but you probably already noticed it comes out toward us and then goes up to 54 floors. It angles back toward the uh, other side of the property, then goes up. Looks like a pencil standing on its point. Uh, we passed it fast, we'll get it later. Another example of this kind of thing. On your left, new building going up, it's the Bank of America Tower, going to open next year, also by Getch Partners. They have a trapezoidal lot, not very big, but uh, more flexible. They had 50% of a lot to build on. Still, they need to have a park and a river walk. You can see where they're going to put the river walk. You can see the work uh, staff walking on the platform there behind those three prong support elements. Uh, between the support columns and the start of the building back under, that's where the river walk is going to go. They hollow out space under the building to take care of the requirements that the city of Chicago places on uh, their design. Okay, after the bridge, uh, on your left is a huge stone-covered building. It is the Civic Opera House. It's in 1929. It was designed by Graham Anderson Probst and White. Uh, it opened six days after the stock market crashed in New York City. Uh, not a good time for any kind of business, let alone an opera. I uh, didn't do too well at, at first, and now it does. Look at the shape of it. Uh, big tower, setback, tallest part of the building. Two wings, one on either side, at that 23 floor limit. Uh, remember we talked about this with Art Deco. Uh, that was the rule of the time, but this building is not really Art Deco. Look at the corner of the building now on your left. Notice they have a triangular shape above the center window, like the entrance of a temple. They have wreaths, they have trumpets, they have theater masks. Uh, that is classical. That really is not Art Deco ornamentation. So this building uh, failed the Art Deco test. But in the 20s, they were doing that uh, two uh, wings and a tower design, no matter what the ornamentation on the building. To your right, back to less is more. There's a development of office buildings on your right, all in the mid-century modern uh, international style. Uh, covered in green glass, uh, this is, you can see the first building. It has kind of, uh, well you can see that it, it uh, has a frame on the outside and uh, is a rectangle. Same kinds of things that we saw before. Simplicity, less is more. Uh, this is called Gateway Center. It was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And it is from the 1960s and 70s and a little bit into the 80s. Uh, twin building right now. The reason we're looking at this uh, is that uh, we should talk a little about Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der Rohe uh, is known as the father of this international style. He was uh, an architect. He grew up in Germany. He became an architect there. He became the head of a very famous architectural school. He had his own architectural firm. Uh, his uh, business was booming in the 1930s. He was teaching hundreds of new architects to design buildings in this simple style. But remember who was in charge of Germany in the 1930s? It was uh, the Nazi party under Adolf Hitler. The Nazi party did not like this simple stuff. They wanted 
classical European styles in their buildings. And since Pendley, they were a dictatorship, uh, they told Mies van der Rohe he had to stop this. Uh, so he did, and he came to the United States and he eventually settled in Chicago, did the same thing again. Had his own architectural firm, was the head of an architectural school, trained hundreds more architects in this style. Uh, so we have a proliferation of this mid-century modern style here. Uh, it changed the face of Chicago, changed the whole look of the area, and really did the same kind of thing throughout the world. People come to Chicago, uh, the, the real enthusiasts on mid-century modern, just to see all of this. One more building in the development on your right now. This is from 1983. Uh, therefore, not mid-century modern. It looks kind of like the building uh, about which we mentioned uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, river is green, building is green, river curves, building curves. I want you to notice a difference. Look at the, at the windows on this building. Uh, they are pinched at the corners and they bulge out and they distort the view of the buildings across the river. They did that on purpose because if you're really trying to make this fit in with the neighborhood in the postmodern time, uh, then you should realize that the river is not flat. The river has ripples in it. So if you're being authentic, your building should have ripples on it. And that's why the uh, curvature and uh, the distortion. Okay, on your right next, humongous masonry covered building. This is the old post office in Chicago. The center part that's lower than the rest is from 1921. The surround at the sides and the back, 1932. You can see Art Deco-ness about them. A lot of vertical elements, including the windows, darkened above and below. This was designed by Graham Anderson Phelps and White. Noteworthy because it was the biggest post office in the world when it was built. 2.5 million square feet, 11,000 people working there. So uh, why was that? Why did we need the biggest post office in the world? Makes some sense already because Chicago is a big city, but we had become a uh, mail order catalog capital. Uh, we had, as you know, Montgomery Ward, but we had Sears Robots and Company, we had Spiegel Catalog, we had about 100 busy catalog companies and people from all over the country ordered things from those companies. So when the orders went out to those people who did the ordering, they had to go out through here. We needed this space, we needed those people. Uh, you notice there's construction work going on. U.S. government moved out of here in 1996. Nobody has lived there ever since. They moved out because uh, the catalog business catalog business was pretty much dead and because uh, technology is taking care of a lot of the work that was done by people, you don't need this anymore. So it sat here, a lot of controversy about what next. Finally, about two years ago, it was purchased by uh, another company. They bought it for $130 million. They are putting $600 million into remodeling it. So now it's a huge office complex, 20-foot ceilings. It's really very spectacular, going to have the river walk in the park uh, at the river level. Uh, there's a five acre park on the roof of this thing. And all kinds of amenities. Companies like uh, Walgreens and Uber are headquartered there now. Okay, to your left, new development on the south branch of the, gov of the uh, river. <coughs> this is called South Bank. It uh, is going to feature um, skyscraper residences. You can see a couple of them already there. It's going to have low-rise residences up towards the river. Uh, it's designed by Perkins and Will. Within a couple of years, then there will be 2,700 people living in this. I want you to notice the stones that are here right at the riverbank. I'll talk about that in a little while. But of course, they're going to have a park in the river walk and do what they're supposed to do. Next building on your left, lots of colors. Uh, this building is River City. It's from 1986 and was designed by Bertrand Goldberg, who was a student of Mies van der Rohe in Germany. Apparently he was paying absolutely no attention in class because this is not a glass rectangle. A lot of curves. Uh, his idea, he had two big ideas. Idea number one was 
Uh, there are no right angles in nature. If you want your building to be natural looking, it is more likely that curves fit that. So he did that. Uh, he had another idea, which was an economic benefit from Chicago. Uh, at the time he designed this, then companies and people were moving out of the city to the suburbs. Chicago was losing money. So here's what you do. Uh, top 11 stories, you design residences where you see the curved windows that look like uh, perfect teeth on unhappy people. And then you go down toward the bottom, plate glass where there are retail stores and offices. And finally, boats at the bottom. Uh, here was his idea. Let people work downtown and play downtown and live downtown all in the same place and they keep their money downtown. So it was nothing is madness that way. Next thing, look to your right. Beyond the fence, not too much scenery. You see a shopping mall over there with BSW and Marshalls. To the right of the shopping mall, there is a radio tower. Uh, thin strips of metal, red and white, nothing too spectacular. We're looking at it though because the, the property over there is where the Chicago fire started in 1871. You probably heard the legend of that. The legend goes, uh, Mrs. O'Leary's barn was on that site. Her cow kicked over a lantern in the barn, set the barn on fire, set the city on fire, burned down the entire downtown of the city. Uh, now, this is largely myth. They could never prove that Mrs. O'Leary or her cow had anything to do with this. In the 1990s, the city of Chicago officially exonerated Mrs. O'Leary and the cow. They have been forgiven. But it really, the fire really did start there. It was a windy day. It was in October. It hadn't rained for almost a month. And so when the barn caught on fire, then all the area around it caught on fire, nothing but wooden buildings. And the wind blew the fire toward the river. Okay, so you'd suppose that uh, the river would stop the fire, but the wind was super strong. So the river didn't stop the fire. The river uh, picked up embers and small chunks of burning buildings, sent them across the river at the direction the boat is facing now. And it set everything over there on fire too. And the fire continued with the wind a mile farther that way, uh, all the way to Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan was big enough to stop the fire. Uh, also, the wind had shifted. The wind was going to the north, the way the boat is facing now. The wind carried the fire uh, up to the main stem of the river where we started out uh, on this boat trip. Uh, the fire again jumped the river set everything on the other side of that main branch of the river on fire. Fire continued for many miles. New Chicago is know where Lincoln Park is. Finally, the fire uh, burned out after about two days. They tried to put this out, but, you know, horses and wagons for fire engines and no electronic communications and this horrific firestorm, they couldn't do that. When it was all over, then a third of the population of the city was homeless. Uh, the population had been 300,000, but uh, 100,000 people had no homes. And uh, it had burned down, again, the entire downtown, the business area, thousands upon thousands of buildings. So what now? Uh, obviously a huge disaster. There were people who were saying, there's no way Chicago is going to recover from this. We might as well give it up. Others, Guttier, were saying, yes, we can rebuild. The river is still here. Lake Michigan is still here. The railroad tracks are still here, even if the railroad stations are not. We can do this. And they started a rebuilding effort. Uh, remember, the population was 300,000 at the time of the fire. And uh, people came here for jobs during the rebuild, rebuilding. And the population jumped. Remember, I told you at the very beginning of the tour, that the population here in 1900 was 1.6 million. So it went 1871, uh, 300,000 to 30 years later, 1.6 million. So lots of people came here for jobs. And some of those people who came here for jobs were architects. A lot of them younger people from the East Coast who uh, wanted to try new things and get a new start uh, in their career. Uh, one of those people was William LeBaron Jenny, and William LeBaron Jenny is credited for inventing the skyscraper here in Chicago. Chicago takes credit for being the place where skyscrapers anywhere originated. And uh, 
William Valera and Jenny had been a designer for bridges in the American Civil War. He used metal bracing. These were, of course, horizontal across streams. That worked out. The war was over. He's then thinking about what should happen in Chicago. And what should happen in Chicago really is that there's a problem at that time with spreading outward, you know, new population, lots of economic development, you need space. Well, in most places, you would spread out from the center of the city, no big problem. Here, if you think about it, downtown Chicago, where it's placed on your right, is kind of like an island. We're on the west side of that uh, property, on the south branch of the river, a mile away is Lake Michigan, so surrounded by water on two sides. Remember the main stem of the river coming in from Lake Michigan? That makes a third body of water. And then, since the bridges were not very good and not very easy to travel, and especially because trains couldn't go over the bridges without collapsing the bridges, the trains all had to come in from the south side. So the trains were blocking the south side of the city and the river branches and the lake were blocking the rest. And if you wanted to do well in business, you better be downtown. Downtown had always been there. The seaport was downtown. Uh, so how do we get everybody downtown? Well, we don't go out from the center of the city. We go up. And here's William LeBaron Jenny, who knows how to build buildings with metal structure. Doesn't need to be horizontal. It can be vertical. So. He builds the first building with a metal frame, uh, super tall, 10 stories tall. And uh, it was so tall that many people were fearful, especially about going up to the top of the building. Uh, but this caught on. So he was not the only designer of metal framed skyscrapers. Uh, many other people were doing that too. And uh, ever since the 1880s, when that first skyscraper happened, uh, we've been crazy about skyscrapers and you're seeing lots of them today. The one that gets the most profile is the Willis Tower, formerly the Sears Tower, and that is the black building, tallest building you can see right ahead of the boat. has two white antennas on the top. Uh, Mid-century modern, you can see the simplicity of it. It's from 1974 by Skidmore Owings and Merrill. Bruce Graham was the lead architect. Fazler Khan was the lead engineer. I want to focus on the engineer for a minute. Tallest building in the world, 110 stories tall. Uh, you better make this building steady. You do not want it moving places. Uh, and this is a very windy city, you know that. So how do you keep this stable? You use what's called bundled tube construction. Hard to see this now, we'll see it later, but this building is squared off vertical tubes, nine of them and they're connected together at the frame. If you had a, a building with just one tower, that would be easier to sway and in more trouble than if you have nine towers and you bind them together. Uh, so that worked. Um, and um, you know, still among the world's tallest buildings, it uh, has 16,000 windows, it has its own zip codes, it has over 100 elevators, still a, a a noticeable place. We'll see it up close later. First of all, notice the pink building in front of the Willis Tower. The pink building in front of the Willis Tower is 300 South to South, excuse me, South Bracker Drive. It is from 1990 and uh, it's by Cohn Pedersen Fox. 1990 makes it postmodern. So uh, when the Willis Tower was built, everything had to be simple. Remember, postmodern is kind of a rebellion time. So you can make your building kind of splashy. And uh, they did bring back history. They brought back stone. They brought back an octagonal tower. So they brought back their history. But notice, mostly they were trying to get noticed. That was part of uh, postmodern too. So how do you get noticed if you're shorter than the tallest building? And you're right next to it. You make your building pink. Uh, it gets noticed in the daytime. Close your eyes all the way up to the top of the pink building. You can see one large glassy drum and some smaller ones. But glass drums on the top pull the lighting system. 1800 fluorescent tubes light up at night. So you see this building at night just like you do in the daytime. 
Since we're here, look back at Willis. You begin to see the vertical tubes going up in the air. They're not all the same height. There are nine of them. You can see about seven of them from here. Uh, first cutoff is 50 floors. Then I think it goes to uh, something like 75. Then it goes up to 110. Back to Willis in a couple minutes. First of all, bring your eyes back to the river front. Notice the black mid-century modern building that's coming up right now. South Black Drive by Epstein and Sons. Um, this tour hosted didn't include it until about four years ago because it's not that exciting. But uh, look what they've done with the concrete canal that goes up the side of the building. They've made a map of the south branch of the river with the streets around it. And look at the red rectangle at the center that pops out towards the top. That is the you are here symbol. So you're not going to get lost. Now, this building gets a lot of attention. I'd like you to look between buildings now and look up at the Willis Tower. You can see that tubular structure look all the way to the top for rectangles that pop out from our side of the building. Uh, you'll have a chance to look at that again between buildings in just a second. Uh, those are the ledges. Maybe you've been up there. The ledges pop out and you can go out on to the ledges at the top of the building as a tourist, look for around for three states worth of scenery and look down between uh, your toes, it's very soft. So now look back up at the top of that building where the antennas are, you can see those ledges, those rectangles that pop out. One quick story about that, um, about five years ago there were some uh, 20 something year old guys uh, sitting cross-legged out on the ledges and uh, on the ledge, and they had a friend taking a picture, and all was going well, they were smiling, and uh, they looked down, and the floor underneath them, the glass floor was cracking, and so they, they panicked, they thought death was near, they jumped back into the building, and uh, caught their breath, they, they, they found out later there are five layers to this floor, so they really were not in danger, they lived, and they got on TV, everything was good. Okay, we're going to look back to your left now. Uh, this is Gateway Center. We already looked at the simple buildings that are here. But what I'd like you to do is look under those buildings. If you look under the buildings and look into the distance, you can see trains. That's because uh, within a couple of blocks, there are two major train stations here. The train tracks uh, came here many, many years ago. They didn't go across the river because the bridges were still coming, but they came up to the river. They beat the buildings here, and so you can't get rid of the railroad tracks, you can't get rid of the railroad stations, but you need offices downtown. So what do you do? You have uh, little spaces between the railroad tracks, and you drop columns down into bedrock to support a giant platform and then you can have the train cars under the platform and still do your office complex on the top. So a lot of creativity about building buildings on prop on platforms. Something to note. Uh, I think the most interesting version of that is across the next bridge, you'll see a red brick building with a clock tower. Look to the right of that red brick building. The tall building there is both aircraft the building is from 1990. Uh, you have a tower with a clock on it, but also, built right after the bridge, there's a wing on the building. The wing comes out of the glass, and the steel presses. Here's the wing of the wing. Think about what happens to a train car when it goes to the car well, you can't put columns between the curvy tracks because the green car corners will hit. So what do you do? You build that network of steel on the top, and the left third of the building hangs down from the top of the building. It has no columns under it at all. So uh, they didn't put a roof on this building. They left it up there to show off the network of steel that does it. It's really an amazing engineering project. Okay, uh, a couple of things about uh, um, fights that we get into in Chicago. 
I already told you about the building on the right, the Bank of America Tower. There was a five-story uh, mid-century modern building here until last year. It was famous because it was by Graham Anderson, Pope, and White. It was famous because it was the initial headquarters in Chicago for Morton Salt. And kind of an interesting blend between mid-century modern and uh, Art Deco. All right, so it was valuable to historically uh, oriented uh, architecture fans. And when they proposed building this, which I think is 52 stories, then there was a, a fight about this. Uh, the Bank of America won the fight. But they, in the end, they uh, promised to put pieces of the old um, Morton Salt building on the front of this building. So we'll see. Uh, historians were not too happy. To your left now, where you see 150 North Riverside Plaza, notice a brick former catalog warehouse in the background. Notice it's residential now, balconies on that. 1999 uh, was when they made it into a residential building. Uh, if you moved in there, you can see that there are lots of windows on this side of the red brick building, balconies on this side of the red brick building. People moved in because of the view. They could see downtown Chicago, they could see the river, it was great. Then they heard this was going up. So, how happy were they then about their view? Not very. So they get angry and say, look at this thing, how does that thing stand up? The wind's gonna come, it's gonna blow that thing right into the river. Are you crazy? That should never be built. Then the, the rebuttal had many facets, but one of them was, well, we build this with the strongest structural materials there are. We even have uh, a system of reinforced concrete water tanks on the roof. The old 200,000 gallons of water, and they help balance it. If you think of this, if you had water on a table and you started to turn the table upside down, the water would try to stay where it was to begin with. So this water is going to help. Uh, this went on, and uh, a lot of people moved out. Uh, some people are still there in the red brick building. Uh, at least they have a park to look at instead of railroad tracks below their balcony. Okay, coming up, huge stone-covered building. Uh, yeah, too late probably. There's a green roof on this shaped like a pyramid, and we should talk uh, a little bit more about that. Uh, King Tut, King Tut's tomb was discovered in Egypt in 1922, and so 20s and 30s, Art Deco, lots of pyramids on buildings. This is the merchandise mark from 1930 by Graham Anderson, Probst and White. It was the largest building in the world when it was built. Uh, four million square feet, largest because of the square footage, and it took up two and a half city blocks. It was designed as a center for department stores to send their buyers, pick out merchandise, have the merchandise sent back from here to their stores. Uh, look behind the American flag, uh, the set of two, and notice the design in the stone there. Notice there are straight lines uh, carved around the entrance. Notice to the left of the entrance there's a carved octagon with zigzags in it. Same on the right side of the entrance. You move your eyes up uh, past the first set of windows above the entrance. There are uh, chevrons and uh, diamonds there. And the reason I'm pointing that out is the ornamentation is the biggest thing about Art Deco. It's simple and the biggest generalization you can make about it is that uh, it is straight lines and geometric figures you can make out of straight lines. So you kind of get the idea of it. That building, by the way, uh, is about 90 years old now. It uh, has changed in many ways. One is it's now trying to be kind to the environment. So is the, the building that has Chicago Cut Steakhouse on the side uh, to your left. This is 300 north of South Street by Picard Chilton. It's from 2009. Um, you can get various levels of award. You can be certified for leadership in energy and environmental design. That's LEED. Uh, you can get silver. You can get gold. You can get platinum. And the Cut Steakhouse building is platinum. Uh, they did lots of things to win their award. One of the things they did was that they cleaned the river water. They bring the river water into the building and pump it up to the top to cool their air conditioning condensers. Then they send it back down, they clean it, 
then they send it back into the river so they've helped to clean the river and they've saved the city of Chicago 9 million gallons of uh, city water per year. Okay, next thing, look down the river ahead of us on the right side of the boat, about six blocks away, look for the dark green building with the golden tip on the top. If you don't see it now, you'll see it right after the bridge. This is the Carbide and Carbon Building. It was built in 1929. It was designed by the sons of Daniel Burnham. It was headquarters for a giant chemical company known for many things that especially uh, ever ready flashlights and batteries. That company wanted a noticeable headquarters. So they hired the sons of Daniel Burnham and their request was, give us a tower that looks like a champagne bottle. So the tower is covered with green terracotta, the color of a champagne bottle, and the tip on the tower is covered in gold leaf. It's real gold, looks like the foil on the cork of a champagne bottle. And uh, their uh, mission was to get noticed, which they did. People are still looking at it. It was especially noticeable because remember in the 1920s, it was the time of prohibition. It was illegal to buy and sell uh, alcoholic beverages, even though it was the Roaring Twenties. And so in that sense, they got noticed too. Okay, uh, on your left next, the building I told you not to pay any attention to. On your left is really a complex of buildings, River City. River City uh, took eight years to build. It was done in uh, 1967. It was done by Bertrand Goldberg, same guy who did River City. Remember, he, he liked nature two cylindrical towers. He thought those would look like trees, the balconies and the uh, apartments where people live are curved. They're like leaves on trees. In the middle between the two towers, there is a simple building that was an office building. Uh, and then recreation, there was a theater here, a bowling alley here, ice skating rink here. And at the bottom, then we've got room for 70 boats. So remember his idea, not only be natural, but have people live downtown and work downtown and play downtown. And that became as it should have. Okay, on your left next, after the bridge, the AMA Plaza. You can see the sign with ivy around it. We're looking at the building. The building is mid-century modern. We're noticing it because this is the last building that Mies van der Rohe himself ever designed. Went up in uh, 1971. He was the less is more God, but he had another slogan, which is God is in the details. Look at the American flag, move your eyes around the corner of the building and look for the windows on that side of the building. Uh, at first, you do not see any. You do not see any because there are industrial eye beams going up the side of the building on, air, on both sides of every window to give some shade. Uh, speaking of shade, uh, Mies van der Rohe wanted the window shades so that they could be all the way up or all the way down or exactly in the middle. It was too sloppy to have them anywhere people wanted to put them. Uh, so God is in the details besides less is more. A subtle um, spacing on that building. Okay, not so subtle. On your left, the uh, Trump International Hotel and Tower. This is from 2009. Uh, the firm of Skidmore, Owings and Merrill designed it. Adrian Smith was the lead architect he is a, a professional designer for the tallest buildings in the world. Uh, the tallest is now the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. He designed that, he's a, a Chicagoan. Uh, we'll look at this a little more when we can see it from a distance, but it has three levels of river walk at the bottom, then glass enclosed hotel lobby, then hotel going up past the Trump sign, finally residences at the top. This is the second tallest building in the city. Um, after Willis, it's 92 floors tall. So more about that later. First, on your left, you can see the Wrigley Building again. We'll pass the Wrigley Building uh, to the building that has construction going on at the top. It looks like a cathedral. Uh, this building uh, is the Tribune Tower, office facilities for the Chicago Tribune newspaper until this year. They moved out. Now it is going to be condominiums. If you want to live in a cathedral, this is a good place to, to look into. This is 1925, designed by Howells and Hood, a replica of the um, cathedral tower in Rouen, France. Historic revival. Okay, take a look to your left, right after the bridge. 
and look at that glassy building right down at the riverfront. That is Apple Michigan Avenue from 2017, Foster and Partners. Uh, it is an Apple store. You can tell because you can see through the glass there is the Apple logo. You can also tell because the roof of the place is shaped like an Apple laptop and then glass all over it. Uh, they uh, not only want to sell Apple products, but they want to be all about the river. Uh, so they give people uh, stair steps and bleachers outside to look at the river. They give them seating, uh, like a theater inside to look at the river. The, the sales floor is on the lowest level right at the river. So interesting, 2017 and went up. Okay, to your right, boat dock where we started. We're gonna pass it and go out to Lake Michigan. But look upwards from there. Uh, Mid-century modern buildings galore. Guess what? They are on a platform because the train tracks are underneath them. This is Illinois Center. Uh, it was an idea by Mies van der Rohe. Put mid-century modern buildings here, and uh, these buildings are so great, uh, they will never go out of style. They have a perfect simplicity. Uh, that's Ross. <laughs> uh, they, they've got their segment of fame, but uh, this was a 1960s, 70s project. By the end of the 70s, uh, that architecture was, was gone. Also, notice that that development on your right is blocked by three levels of um, Wacker Drive, a Chicago street. And so the entrances and the uh, activity of these buildings is really back from within. These buildings were trying to ignore the polluted river. Okay, 1970s come, not only is that style over, pollution is pretty much remedied. To your left, um, city front center, postmodern development of the 80s and 90s. And now we like the river. River walk, and steps going up to that tall building there. The tall building, by the way, is uh, NBC Broadcasting in Chicago, uh, 1989. Notice the windows, vertical stripes, looks like it ought to be an Art Deco building. Remember that postmodern is bring back history. This building is called Echo Deco, and uh, so you can see that pattern. Now, uh, I'd like you to look at the, the shape of the river here. This is a straight line from the beach behind us all the way out to Lake Michigan. The distance from one side of the river to the other is the same everywhere. We've seen curves on the river before, why not here? Because this is not a nature-made part of the river. This used to be Lake Michigan here. Uh, where we started in our boat dock was also Lake Michigan. And uh, so, landfill on your right, landfill on your left. Uh, history of that, remember the Chicago fire? Burned down the whole downtown. What do you do with the, the leftover pieces and rubble from the burned down buildings? You have to do something so you can rebuild, dump them in the lake. You build skyscrapers, you build you big foundations for the skyscrapers, you're still in a hurry, what do you do with the soil you dug up? You dump it in the lake. So the lakefront was not very pretty for a long time. Now it is, but the landfill is here because of uh, the fire in the aftermath. Look to your left, by the way, between buildings, lots of glassy skyscrapers. Most of those are residential buildings. It's a contemporary development. Uh, called River East, uh, and we talked earlier about lots of people moving downtown. On your left, right at the riverfront, there's a fountain. The fountain is the Nicholas J. Mellis water cannon, uh, which won't fire upon us, and Centennial Fountain. The Centennial part is that this is a fountain done to remember the reversal of the Chicago River. Uh, the fountain was built 100 years after the Metropolitan the Chicago Sanitary District was um, formed. I notice the steps on the fountain to the left, they point toward the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico. Steps on the right point out toward Lake Michigan and all the way to New York City, for that matter. The designer of this was Dirk Lohan, who's a grandson of Miss Van der Rohe. Uh, development on your left now, orange and green, two towers. This is called Riverview condominiums and townhouses. It's from 2005. The Stefano and Partners designed it. A little vocabulary. Condominiums, depends on where you're from, but uh, maybe you have not uh, an idea of that in your head at this point. Condominiums are apartments, but not rented out. 
for the most part instead owned by the people who live there. So they're owned like houses. And then townhouses are here. That's the low level at the bottom, going from left to right, just on the river walk. Uh, those are low rise. They uh, are designed so that various residents share walls side to side. Everybody gets an entrance though out to the river walk. Um, we are now coming to the last bridge that uh, we'll go under today. We have been under 24. This is 25 coming up. Uh, this is the Franklin D. Roosevelt Memorial Bridge. It's from 1937. Uh, that's Art Deco time. So look at the towers on the left and the right where the mechanics are for raising and lowering this bridge. This bridge opens in the middle and has two to the towers, one on the left and one on the right. Uh, the towers are octagonal. Remember the octagons on front of the merchandise mark? They have straight lines, horizontal straight lines at the top, carved. Franklin D. Roosevelt, President of the United States, uh, came here to open this bridge. He uh, opened it in, for a couple of reasons, but the big one to remember, I suppose, is you remember the Depression, uh, you remember the, the government agencies that put people to work, almost all of them had three missions like the TVA and the CCC. This was put up by government workers, the Work in Progress uh, Administration, the WPA. So significant because of uh, what was happening during Roosevelt's time. Also significant because of the highway that goes over the bridge, and we'll get to that too. But first, on this side of that bridge, uh, there's supposed to be no buildings built. Hmm. Okay. If you look on the left, that kind of looks like a building over there, that black curvy thing. Uh, that's from 1968. It's by Shipwrights and Heinrich. They were uh, students of Mies van der Rohe's also. They took a few liberties themselves. The building has curves. That's for wind resistance. And since this was the, the tallest apartment building in the world in 1971, then it uh, gives people good views. So a few liberties. Take a look at the very bottom of that building. Notice it does have the see-through lobby. You, look, you can look all the way through the building at the bottom and see trees on the other side. Okay, well what's it doing here then, if there are no buildings allowed here? Uh, there was a loophole in the law. The loophole in the law was you can build on uh, this side of Lakeshore Drive if you uh, do it at the mouth of the Chicago River. Well, that's where we are. They get to put that up. I think the reason is coming up on your left when you see the Ferris wheel is Navy Pier. Probably many of you have been there. Navy Pier dates back to 1916. It was a Daniel Burnham idea. Daniel Burnham was trying to develop a plan to make Chicago more beautiful and more practical. And uh, you see the beauty of the towers with the copper on top uh, and the style of those towers. But practicality, uh, there were boats coming into the Chicago River so frequently that many of them had to wait in line to get into the Chicago River. So how do we make that more practical? We build a uh, harbor uh, a pier out into Lake Michigan, and that's why that's here. Uh, now, uh, you may know it, entertainment center like crazy, anything that you want to do that's fun, you can, you can find there. Okay, to your right, uh, notice that there is a channel of water going out past the tower with an American flag. That is the, the lock that separates Lake Michigan from the Chicago River. That's from 1937. It wasn't here before that time. It's here because uh, we got sued. We got sued before when the river took the sewage to St. Louis, uh, and we won because we were quick. We opened the gates before the court could decide anything. Here, uh, we got sued by the states of Michigan and Wisconsin and Indiana because we were, in essence, draining Lake Michigan. There was no limit to the water that could come in uh, to flush the sewage down to the Mississippi River. Uh, and we were wrecking business in a lot of ways, especially businesses that were recreational with beaches and, and fishing and so forth. Uh, so they sued, they won. Now the boats have to pass through that lock going out to Lake Michigan or coming in from it. If you haven't already, good place to take a uh, skyline picture. 
and then we'll get back to buildings and go back to the dock. Okay, um, back to some buildings. One is going to disappear, so I want you to see it uh, soon. Um, looking ahead, to the left, you see a wavy blue tower, and we'll get to that later, but to the left of the wavy blue glass tower, you can see a white stone-covered building with vertical slats for the window. So it's like with bugs and all the other buildings. Uh, it looks pretty short compared to the new one going up, but it, it is now the fourth tallest building in the city is from 1974. It was designed by Edward Durrell Stone and it was uh, corporate headquarters for the Standard Oil Company of Indiana. They wanted something noticeable. So they decided the way to get noticed was to build a new building, have it be as tall as tall can be, and cover it with marble. So they arranged to bring marble here from Italy. They brought 44,000 slabs of marble uh, to put on the building. They envisioned the building of a marble mountain. It was going to be terrific. But to remember Chicago winters, it's miserable here. Uh, and it freezes and thaws and freezes and thaws. And they cut the marble too thin to withstand the weather. So the marble started to bulge out from the sides of the building. This building is 83 floors tall. Uh, so how would you like to be walking around the base of the building with the danger of the marble falling off the side of the building? Not very appealing. So Standard Oil had to do something. And they decided to try to band the uh, marble onto the building with metal. Uh, that didn't really stop the bulging. They finally decided the only thing to do was to tear all the marble off the building. And they did that. Uh, they tore all the marble off. They put granite on instead, that white granite. Uh, it cost them $80 million to do that. Sorry about the noise. So $80 million is a high price, but if you're Standard Oil, you can do it. But in the process, Standard Oil learned the lesson not to take their marble for granted. Okay, on the left now, uh, Another residential development. This is Lake Shore East. Uh, it is about 28 acres worth. Skyscrapers all around. It's a beautiful park in the middle. It's amazingly quiet in there because the skyscrapers shut out the noise of the city. The theme of it is a water theme. The second building that we're coming to, the one with kind of an orange wing beside it and a tree on top. It's called Regatta, as in boat race. But we need to talk about the most spectacular one here, the wavy glass one. That is the Vista Tower. It uh, has been worked on for over a year. It should be ready. Next year, it's going to be um, a hotel at the bottom, the first 11 stories. Then it has three adjacent tall towers going up. Uh, the one that's the shortest is on the left. That is about, uh, what was it, about 46 floors tall. The one in the middle is more like 75 floors tall. And then finally, I'm sorry the sun is not but the tallest one is totally 101 floors tall. Uh, this is uh, the third tallest building in the city. Uh, the idea is water theme again. You have uh, blue glass and you have waves going on here. They uh, selected, well they have the glass at angles so that uh, it sparkles when the sun shines on them. Uh, Something else to look at. Look all the way up from the tallest tower, we're eight floors below the top. You'll notice an empty space in the glass up there. There's one floor that they put no glass over. 
that's deliberate. Uh, they left it open so the wind can blow through it. They're trying to stabilize this building with a blow-through floor. So the back floor is just for the wind. This was designed, by the way, by Jeannie Gang of Studio Gang, who has made a grand reputation for herself as an architect, showing everybody that you don't have to be a man to be an architect anymore. To your left now, just after, between buildings, after the building with the point, look at the building back there with the wavy balconies and the blue glass uh, between and among those balconies. That is Aqua, the water theme again, also by Jeannie Gang in 2009. Here's the idea, you have waves like the waves in Lake Michigan, the wavy balconies race the building against the wind, and they have them shaped so that if you live there, the balcony comes in toward your window so you have a better view of Chicago from up there. Uh, another building by Jimmy Gang, 87 floors tall. It is a uh, hotel at the bottom and residences all the way up. She won the Skyscraper of the Year in 2009 for that building. Okay, let's see. After the bridge, before we go back to the dock, do take one last look ahead of us at the Trump International Hotel and Tower. When we were right next to it, you couldn't really see it, its height. Uh, remember, 92 floors tall. Beautifully shaped, it has angles, it has curves. It was designed especially to fit on the piece of ground that was available to build it on. Uh, it reflects the sun, so that it's cooler inside. Uh, you notice that it has horizontal um, rows of gray at the uh, top of each of the sections going up. And uh, with that, they're trying to honor buildings around, uh, including the Wrigley Building, including uh, the AMA Plaza. But something else before we quit with that building. It is beautiful. It is the second tallest in the city. It's 92 floors. But that wavy blue glass building is the third tallest at 101 floors. So that's funny math. Uh, here's what's going on. Uh, there is a, an organization called the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. They get to decide what's taller than what, and they have criteria. Uh, one of the criteria is if it's part of the design of the building, even though it goes above the living area, uh, it counts. So Trump is second because that spire on top goes above the 92 floors. So interesting things happening in that area too. But here we dock, so I better be finishing up.